everyone. Uh, so this is the last talk of this session. Uh, after this will be lightning talks. Um, please ask any questions that you have in the Q&A, and we can go over them at the end. Uh, so Draga, take it away. Thank you, John. Hi, everyone. Uh, apologies for the late start. Uh, we're going to talk today about big data, uh, low effort visualization of bigger than RAM satellite images uh, in Napari. A little bit about myself first. I'm Draga. I'm a computer science graduate from Monash University uh, in Melbourne. And as part of my honors work, I worked with Sentinel two-way satellite images as a novel case study for Napari. Uh, I'm teaching at the moment and also contracting part-time for Napari, uh, which is what exactly? Uh, so Napari is an n-dimensional uh, image viewer. It offers both 2D and 3D rendering, and it adds sliders for any additional dimensions. Uh, there's an example of that coming. It's pure Python, so it allows you easily to integrate existing scientific analysis workflows um, into the viewer and into your uh, workflow in general. It's fully open source. Uh, in fact, please come contribute if what you see here today uh, seems to interest you. Um, and it's very community driven. So there's weekly community meetings uh, suiting most time zones. Uh, so we'd love to have you around if it's something that you're interested in. OK, so what does it mean for it to be n-dimensional? Uh, as I mentioned, Nefario was built first and foremost with high dimensional images in mind. Uh, so let's see an example of what that looks like uh, with publicly available data from the cell tracking challenge um, of Chinese hamster ovarian nuclei. Um, so we're in an IPython window here. We've got a root path to a folder of diffs. We import Nefario, and then from Dask image, we import imread to read that stack of tiffs um, using the imread function on the root path we get a uh, Dask array into the embryo variable. And if we check that, we can see that it is indeed a Dask array. We can see it's got four dimensions. Uh, and then we can kick, kick off an Apari viewer. And in IPython, we can do that interactively. And uh, we can simply sure. add the embryo uh, image to the viewer. Yeah. Can you make the text bigger? Someone was asking about that in the comments. No, if you... uh, I'm afraid I can't, because this is a pre-recorded video. Um, ah, OK. Yeah, sorry about no, that. It's... Um, but as we can see, uh, we've opened the um, embryo, and we've got two sliders, one of them for the volume. And if we go in 3D mode, we can see we can move around the volume, but we've still got uh, the time slider for that fourth dimension, allowing us to browse through the image. Uh, now, another great benefit of Napari is you've got um, all these different layer types. So we saw an example of images. We're going to see an example with labels. Uh, but Napari also supports shapes, tracks, points, and surfaces. Um, and so that makes it really easy to seamlessly integrate your analysis results with the raw data uh, that you're working on. And in the following example, we're going to be using the cells 3D sample data from Scikit Image. Um, so again, we're just importing Napari uh, into the IPython console. We're getting uh, some filters, so the threshold dots filter to get a binarized image. And then we're going to get uh, the label function just to do a quick and dirty segmentation. Uh, again, we're going to just open the Napari viewer. And we're going to load the membrane and the cell nuclei layer using Napari's uh, viewer.opensample, which allows you to specify a repository and the name of your sample data. And it opens that uh, for you as two Napari layers. Now, because these are Napari layer types, we're going to take just the data, uh, just the underlying array. And as we can see when we scroll through, we've got a nice color map and some pretty nuclei that we're going to segment. First step in the segmentation is we're just going to um, run threshold .su on the cell nuclei data and then get a binarized image out of that. And then, of course, we're going to use the label function on that binarized image uh, to label all of the different regions of um, the nuclei. And once that's done, we can simply make a call to add labels uh, on the viewer. And we can see we get, uh, once that's added, we're going to make it translucent so we can see the nuclei underneath. Uh, and once that's added, we can scroll through and we can see uh, the labeled nuclei. And it's done pretty well for a uh, um, three second to 10 second uh, segmentation example. Um, another great aspect of Napari is uh, it's software after my own heart. So it's lazy by nature. 
And what that means is if it's given a stack of images um, or a 3D volume, it's going to lay uh, just what's displayed on screen wherever possible. Uh, so wherever it can, if it's given, say, a folder of TIFFs, it's going to um, load that folder as uh, a dask array and get you that delayed computation and lazy computation uh, for free. I do have an example for that, but in the interest of time, uh, we'll skip through. Uh, the final aspect I want to talk about and the aspect that I'm most excited about is how easy it is to extend the functionality of Napari through plugins. Uh, we're going to see an example of reader plugins. Uh, so what that is, is it allows developers to define functions that open file formats that would otherwise not be supported by Napari. But later, we're also going to see examples of, uh, of some GUI plugins as well. Uh, so these examples are using images of platelets swarming towards a thrombus in a live mouse. Uh, those were provided by PLR Larson from Monash uh, and also mouse blastocysts, and that's publicly available uh, at the IDR. And so if we look inside this folder, we can see we've got uh, ZAR. Now, ZAR is not natively readable by Napari, but if we install OME ZAR, uh, which it provides a reader for OME ZAR images, we can launch a viewer directly uh, pointing it to that ZAR file. And the viewer will load the ZAR without any issues. It's got color map metadata from the uh, file format, and we can scroll through without any worries. Um, now, the next example we're going to see is with ND2 images. Um, so ND2 images are. I'm uh, sorry, I'll just let this run through. Um, so ND2 images are acquired by Nikon microscopes. Again, if we just try and drag that into Napari, it's going to tell us there's no plugin capable of reading it. Um, but if we install ND2 task, which is just one of the available ND2 readers for Napari, and then try and drag that uh, file in again, we can see that it opens relatively quickly. It's got all the different channels there, and we can view it in 3D mode uh, and scroll through time. And we can see the platelets swarming towards uh, that big thrombus. Uh, so the plugin architecture is where I really started working with Napari. And uh, it was during some work on Sentinel-2A images. And we were working to provide an interactive system for researchers who are working on a land cover study of the state of Victoria in Australia. Uh, and then we're using the Sentinel images to produce this Monash veg map. Um, as we can see in, on the website, on the left there, we've got the high resolution satellite images. And on the right, we've got the land cover classification uh, with a legend. Uh, and the key issue for these researchers is they were having difficulty viewing these images over time. Uh, so loading the full stack of time points available for a tile. Um, but also even when they threw more RAM at the problem uh, and just loaded all the images on a you know, 250 gigabyte RAM machine, they had trouble comparing the different visualizations. Uh, so like the labels, the interpolated data, the raw data, and validating their results. Um, and we were hoping that's where Napari could come in. Uh, so let's take a look at their workflow. The first step, of course, was acquiring the uh, images. Uh, that was done using uh, PEPS, which is a French platform that provides open access to the Sentinel images. Um, and once the download from PEP was finished, you ended up with this folder. Uh, one folder per MGRS tile, um, geographical tile. Uh, so for example, in the 55HBU folder and in all folders, you had zips. Um, and each zip corresponded to one time point of acquisition. And inside every zip were, I think, about 14, maybe more, um, TIFFs, each corresponding to a band of acquisition. Um, one zip file was over 100 gigabytes uh, in size. And so you can imagine um, more uncompressed, of course. And so you can imagine that um, decompressing you know, 100 time points of 100 gigabytes and trying to show those is not reasonable. Um, and these raw images often were cloudy, right? Because Victoria uh, is cloudy like all of the time. Uh, so often they had clouds. And then sometimes, because of the satellite's orbit, you only got part of a tile um, image. You know? So you just get a little rectangle or a triangle um, in the bottom. Uh, right-hand corner, which, of course, if you're going to perform analysis, uh, is not very handy. So the next step in the workflow was doing image interpolation. So looking at previous time points that you know weren't cloudy and were nicely acquired, and using those to interpolate future time points, uh, not going back more than 10 days. At the end of that interpolation step, what you got was a big TIFF cube. 
um, with 73 time points, uh, so one every five days. And that was passed to a, a CNN for classification. And then we got the labeled images uh, out of that. So the first step was just making a raw reader uh, for Napari. And the Napari plugin architecture is fairly simple in that if you have a function that can read a path from a disk into an array-like format, like this is doing with um, np.load, then you can tell Napari how to use that using uh, Napari get reader hook implementation. Uh, and all this is saying is, hey, if the path is a string and it's a NumPy file, here's a function that can read that file. Now, for our reader, the bread and butter was this task delayed function, which took a zip and a path to a tiff within that zip. Um, and it allowed us to open the zip and just take that particular tiff uh, on slice. So rather than having to unzip everything and stack it, when you slice to a particular time point, it's only then that we access the tiffs inside that zip file. Um, and so this is an example of that in action. As we can see, we've installed Napari Sentinel zip, which provides the reader. And then if we drag in one of the tiles, uh, pretty quickly, it opens up with the preview JPEG, which is 1,000 by 1,000 pixels. Uh, and we can scroll through time um, very smoothly, seeing all of the many clouds uh, that Victoria has to offer. Uh, but of course, if we zoom in on that, that's very re low resolution, right? That's only 1,000 by 1,000 pixels. So we have to um, make visible the red, green, and blue bands um, in full resolution, which is 10,000 by 10,000 pixels. And so, of course, um, that takes a bit of time to bring from disk. Um, but it does allow us to view the full resolution images uh, in the viewer uh, in one step. Of course, this is not exactly real time. Uh, and it would be impossible to do with the interpolated data um, for reasons I'm going to go into now. So the interpolate, if you, if you want to view images and you've got a stack of slices, ideally, time is your first axis. Because then when you uh, index into the first axis, you get a full slice, uh, full x, y slice to display. Unfortunately, the interpolated data was not in that format. Time was the last axis. So in order to view, uh, if you were to index into the first axis, you'd just get this row. So in order to display any given slice, you would have to scan all of the rows, which means scanning the whole tube, uh, which is unideal. So we need a different format. And that format that we chose was a chunked OMEZAR format. Uh, and chunking meant we had good access both along uh, the time axis for display uh, and along sort of the XY axis for analysis um, of a pixel across all of the time points. Second step was multi-scaling the images. Uh, so creating pyramids with lower resolutions to allow us to load more quickly. Um, and so we provided a command line utility for the researchers to convert one big TIFF cube uh, to OMEZAR format. And we chose to store in an OMEZAR format because even though it's built for microscopy, it offered multi-scale images, uh, color map and contrast limits metadata. It already had an Apari reader, um, and it had released a spec for labels, which are the final images uh, that are produced um, during this workflow. Uh, this is what the labels look like. And of course, they're associated with a legend. Um, they're pretty small, but the key issue was that it's difficult to uh, map between one pixel in the labels and one pixel in the raw image if those are loaded in separate viewers, uh, as was the case for our researchers. Uh, so we multi-scaled these labels, and we transformed them into OMUSR format as well. And so let's take a look at what all of that looks like uh, in Napari and take a look at some um, sort of analysis functions as well. Uh, so here we've got raw channels, interpolated channels, and the labels loaded into Napari. These are pretty big images. Again, we've got the multi-scale uh, full resolution. We get pretty good browsing and pretty good scrolling through time points. Uh, we can see towards the middle of the year, uh, due to bushfires and drought, Victoria dried up. And uh, towards the end of the year, uh, it started recovering again. We can bring the labels up uh, pretty easily, change the opacity on those to get an idea of the pixels underneath. And if we hover over a label, we can actually see its classification in the bottom left here. So this is native woody cover. Uh, this is urban uh, water is water. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, and uh, you know, let's say we were to zoom out a little bit. If we go sort of uh, towards the end, we can see it recovering. And then we can see, you know, we've got these cloud artifacts here. Uh, 
And before it was before loading the data into an Apari, it was very difficult for researchers to uh, be able to see why that cloud cover persisted. Uh, but because we've got the raw data available, um, we can see that in fact, um, the this particular day and time was only partially imaged. We just had this, uh, you know, uh, little corner that was imaged. And then if we go back through time, we got a pretty cloudy day. Uh, and if we go back even more, again, we had another partially imaged tile. And so it's easy to see how um, by these uh, next days, we were not able to fully uh, mask away the cloud cover and we ended up with some artifacts. Um, now, one uh, really useful uh, index that is used by researchers commonly when working with uh, vegetation and with, cloud, uh, with um, land cover is the Eddie index. So one of the uh, GUI plugins allows us to select the red layer and the NIR layer. Uh, and if we hit run, we get an NDVI layer uh, lazily added to the viewer. And so when we scroll to different time points, um, we can see so green, uh, like dark green means healthy vegetation, red means uh, unhealthy vegetation or water. And so we can see here the native woody cover uh, is, is pretty uh, green, even if we go to the uh, driest part of the year, we can see that we still got a bit of green there. Um, and that's the NDVI layer. But another uh, cool little plugin that we were able to build for the researchers uh, to allow them to get more insight into the images is the NDVI profiles. Um, so if I scroll back to a time point um, where we have some clouds, select the red and NIR layers again, we can start, and as we can see, we've had a points layer added to Napari and uh, a matplotlib canvas down the bottom. Now, if we zoom in a little bit uh, towards the cloudy area, we can add some points. So let's say we add a point uh, like here in this farmland. Napari is then going to go away and compute the profile at, at that coordinate over time. And once it's computed that, it's going to add it uh, to the uh, matplotlib canvas as a line. And we can see that even in the NDVI profile, we start off pretty green in the farmland, we really dry off towards the end of the year, uh, and then we start to slowly look up, recover. And if we were to add a point over the cloudy area, hopefully we would be able to see um, this interpolation error also highlighted uh, in the NDVI to make it easier for us to analyze what's gone on uh, with this um, with this particular pixel or with this area of pixels. Uh, so once that computation is complete, another line is added to the viewer. And we can see indeed that once those clouds come up, we get a sharp drop in the NDVI, which was otherwise doing pretty well over the year because again, the native woody cover uh, handled itself pretty well. And we can even move that point. Let's say we move it out of the cloud area. Napari then goes away and recomputes for the new coordinate. And if we give it a little bit of time, we're going to see uh, that profile change to the new pixel. Um, and there we go. Uh, so this is a you know pretty good system. Uh, there's a lot that it can do that the researchers weren't able to do before. It's um, relatively uh, near real time, considering that there's terabytes of data uh, in this entire, um, you know, between the raw data, the interpolated, uh, and all the different time points. And um, I hope it's you know shown you a little bit of what Napari can do in terms of um, in terms of plugins. Now, of course, there's some limitations to the system. Uh, the first is processing time. It took about 40 hours from TIFF cube to multi-scale OMEs R format, uh, which is not ideal. At the time, we tried to use rechunker um, in order, which came out last year, uh, to do better rechunking and faster processing. But we actually ended up with a slower estimate. Uh, for that. So if anyone has an idea uh, of, of how to use Rechunker, whether it was user error uh, or anything like that, we'd love to hear from you. And finally, of course, uh, another limitation was just acquiring the tiles. Um, I am running out of time. So I just wanted to say before I go, uh, if you're interested in Napari at all, if you like what you've seen here, there are sprints for the Australia time zone coming up in a couple of hours. Um, otherwise, feel free to look us up and join the community meetings. Um, yeah, I think that's everything from me. Let's start it. That was great. And then uh, we have a few questions. And if anybody else has questions, feel free to write them in the Q&A. But I'll go through the ones that we have now. Um, 
how large are the data sets you're typically working with? And also where are you storing them? Yeah, so these, um, these were stored locally, uh, just on a hard drive, which is, of course, the least ideal way to store pretty much anything uh, because it's not shareable at all. Um, you can, so we did store some of them uh, remotely on IDR, uh, courtesy of Josh Moore, who allowed us to store them there, even though they have nothing to do with microscopy. Um, and that was pretty good uh, for our French researchers. She, uh, she had pretty good access to um, that remotely because Napari can load data remotely. Uh, but for us here in Australia, of course, you know, um, that was a bit laggy, uh, to say the least. Um, now, how big are they? So the one of the so the TIFF cube, the interpolated data cube, that is about 170 gigabytes. Um, and then the uh, raw images are about as big again when you consider all of the uh, different channels. The, t the the labels are pretty small; they're about 500 megabytes. Um, but all up, uh, yeah, what we were looking at there was probably about sort of 400 gigabytes, um, uh, 400 gigabytes in size, uh, which is considerable. Uh, and uh, actually, we did get pretty lucky because ZA has very good compression. So we actually gained a little bit of um, disk, uh, disk usage. Uh, I see another question here. John, I'm not sure if you're connected. So I'll just go through. You are? Yep. Sorry. Brief connection issues. Yeah. So no, the other no. question was, uh, how easy is it to add your own plugins? Uh, if you have your own image processing routines, can you package them up as plugins if you want to use? Uh, so yes, you can. So there's there's two hooks that we provide. Uh, I'm going to link to the creating an Apari plugin guide as well. Uh, there's two links that you uh, we provide that um, sorry, two hooks that we provide that allow you to. Um, add GUI analysis and, and processing um, workflows. What we can't do at the moment, though it is on the list, is uh, chaining uh, calls, so like chaining workflows. Um, but you can do a fair bit. And in terms of how easy it is, um, it's pretty easy. We provide a lot of documentation around how you can create your first plugin. There's a lot of example plugins um, as well. and. Um, there is also a cookie cutter template. Uh, so basically what you can do is if you can run the cookie cutter template and it will create the entire package configuration for you. So you can just focus on saying, okay, what, am I, what functions am I actually doing? How can I tell Napari about them? Um, if you try and create a plugin and you run into um, issues, definitely feel free to post on uh, ImageSC forum with the Napari tag and we would love to help you. Um, and you can also join the Zulip, which is a more live chat. Uh, and there's someone there um, pretty much around the clock when you consider all the different time zones um, that we all live in. But yeah, if you run into any issues as you're trying to create a plugin, uh, definitely uh, ping us via whatever channel you would, uh, prefer, and we'd love to help you. Great. Thank you. Any more questions? If not, thank you, Draga. That was great. Uh, if other people think of questions afterwards that they forgot to ask, please find Draga. Um, and also, please come to Lightning Talks after. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>